Welcome back to Rotoviz Overtime. We had a fantastic show earlier this week. We were delighted to be joined by Mike Brody. We are joined by him once again, the CEO over at ApexFantasyLeagues.com. We had a great conversation kind of diving into the layout of the site, but also some strategy. If you haven't heard that show so far, that one is available obviously on the Rotoviz podcast feed if you want to listen to it after this one, whichever way you want to do it. But we're going to talk about some different topics today, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Sean, we have Mike back once again. You ready to ready to hit this one off? I am. I am. And I really enjoyed Monday's discussion and learned some things that are going to be really helpful as we go forward. I'm interested in looking at this first question today because one of the things that mike discussed was that we're trying to build these teams that get better as the season goes along you're trying to qualify for the playoffs and so anytime that you have sort of a tiered playoff system it's really cool because the teams that are in that top four type of category are making a real push to try and make sure they get the buy because if you get the buy it's going to dramatically increase your chances to win the overall title if you're in that five six seven eight you know even nine ten range you're making that push to make the playoffs and you're hoping to go on a run. That was the situation that I was in this past year. I drafted a bunch of running backs as we talked about on the last show. That's not my preferred way to do it. One of the things that happened, one of those guys, JK Dobbins gets hurt right away. And so then you're thinking, okay, well, I mean, at the very least we have some redundancy here, even though that was obviously not what we wanted to have happen. Wanted to have the you know, potentially highest scoring player. I still think JK Dobbins could have been like the RB two this past year and so mostly it's just very sad for him in his real life because that injury has a gigantic impact now on his overall career but you have that and then i was very lucky i got the 101 now the 101 in apex this year in our specific experts league had the downside of basically all the receivers being gone when it gets back to me so that's how we kind of got into this running back heavy start but at the 101 you get to take justin jefferson and i was very excited about that Took him instantly, obviously, and I mean, he's scoring until he gets hurt, but I don't think it'll come as a surprise to anybody that with that injury, I was battling to make the playoffs and was very lucky to do that. I sneak in and then go on the run, and as Mike was generous enough to mention in part one, I did win the title this year, which was very exciting to me because of who's in this, because of the great league that Mike has built and the tradition kind of through this. I mean, it was a real thrill for me. So i love that part of it as again we do when we when we win but i wanted to know mike what was the kind of defining element from a player perspective in 2023 specifically in apex leagues and what was the tension if there was any between sort of the regular season champions the guys who got people to the playoffs and maybe created a lot of buys a lot of teams have the one seed the two seed and then if there were differences between those players and the players who got you through, I'm sure as people are listening to you know what I'm saying, they're like, Sean, we don't understand how you had any chance to be competitive in this league, much less win it. I mean, a couple of the guys who were lucky for me, obviously, were Brees Hall and then Rasheed Rice was one of the receivers I had to add late in order to get some receivers into this format, which again, is a 2-3-1 format. And in a 2-3-1, two, two running back, three wide receiver, one tight end, or you know, really two, three, one in terms of one flex. I mean, you want that flex position, you know, without the tight end premium element, you want that flex position probably to be a wide receiver. I'm fighting just to get the wide receivers covered. So Rice goes in there. Who were the guys who won leagues for people in 2023? I mean, definitely Christian McCaffrey has to be mentioned. I think everybody will remember him from this season, um, especially while we're talking all about this wide receiver heavy element. Don't forget that Christian McCaffrey almost scored 400 fantasy points and outscored every other running back by over 100 points. Um, I think Puka had a huge impact where people were either able to draft him at the end of drafts or pick him up and add I mean, a first round pick essentially to your roster, that makes a huge difference. Um, I think Lamb and Amon Ra were huge. Uh, just the week in, week out consistency, big games during the playoffs. Sam Laporta finishing as a number one tight end, most of the times draft outside of the first 10, 11, 12 rounds. Uh, Kyron Williams, 
Uh, many, same as Puka, many leagues undrafted in places he was drafted. I mean, you're in great shape. Many this of these- year, more so, I think, than some years. There, there was like some just absolute like league breaking players in terms of like if you didn't have them, you just could not win. And I, I, it, feel, it feels a little bit unusual, you know, sitting in hindsight with a lot of these guys going, as you mentioned with Sam Laporta, like after 10 rounds, but some of these guys going, you know, in the 16 through 18 round range, that just if you didn't happen to pick them in your draft, you had no chance. It feels like that might be a standout element from last year that probably can't repeat itself. You know, you know when we're looking at trends that repeat and don't repeat? I would feel that that would... Do you agree on that or disagree? Because what happens every year is, who is this year's X? Who is this year's yeah. Puka? Who is this year's... And the likelihood is that that's a unicorn that does not occur again. Yeah, I think the ADP is generally more efficient, as you're saying. I, I don't think you can expect a Puka, a Kyron, a Sam Laporta. I mean, these are big hits. And a Puka, what, he just had the best rookie season of all time? Or, in fact, I think he was a few points behind Jamar Chase's rookie year. But either way, like expectations right versus reality, Jamar Chase was going in the fourth round. Puka was going undrafted, and here he is looking like a Hall of Famer. So... I think that you shouldn't expect to have those guys, but it does show the importance of later round picks. I think like I see some people leave apex drafts, maybe in the 14th, 15th round where it's like, have a good night guys. I'm out of here. And I I think that taking those late round home run swings um, is probably worth it. And this year indicated that. Um, in terms of who produced in the playoffs, I think the Lamb, Lamb, CMC, Brees Hall, Kyron had huge playoff runs. Amari Cooper with his 50 point week 16, I didn't expect, especially when, I mean, you expect these young players to get better down the stretch, um, which is part, part of the reason that I think disappointing for me were Bijan, who like they're not giving him the work, even though he's a young player that they invested so much in. I think you wouldn't, I, I probably would have told friends or something that drafted Bijan, don't worry, he'll get the work as time goes on. And by the end of the season, he'll be the guy that you want him to be. That wasn't the case. Um, I think A-Chan was kind of frustrating where you have this guy, maybe he was on your bench during some of his big weeks. You put him in, he gets hurt. He comes back there playing him very carefully, worried about him getting injured. Maybe he's in your lineup for with low totals. So that part was a little frustrating because, I mean, I drafted a fair amount of HN and was very excited about it. And then now he'll be super expensive and you didn't necessarily get the benefits of drafting him, at least during the time that it was most important. Um, Swift was a guy that kind of disappointed down the stretch that I know all of us were very excited about where Swift I mean, early in the season, first game, they don't want to give him any work. Then they give him all the work and you're like, yes, this this is the thesis. It's playing out. He's a stud. And then that kind of fades into the sunset. Um, those guys are disappointing. I think there's also like Keenan Allen getting injured. That can happen. Kelsey, Diggs, Kamara fading down the stretch. For me, it's why I enjoy having younger players more. I'm not hugely surprised when down the stretch... Kelsey is struggling. I mean, the guy at some point is going to fade off. And when you hold off father time for so long, I think other people are like, oh, well, last year you said he was going to fall off. But as each year goes on, it only becomes more likely that it's going to happen. So I'm not as surprised seeing these old players disappoint. Um, The younger players, I think it's a little bit more frustrating. Speaking about old players, uh, you mentioned Amari Cooper. The one thing that we couldn't have seen in the offseason last year when people were drafting is we could not have seen Joe Flacco playing at an MVP level <laughs> towards the end of the season. So that definitely was interesting to see his 50-point game, but hopefully that means that somebody else will draft him nice and early uh, in this upcoming season's drafts and give us an opportunity. A couple of the players you mentioned there, like you, you mentioned Achan and Obviously, the young, exciting, talented player who kicks the season off has his injury, but Raheem Mostert was pretty much ridiculous is probably the word to use for him this season in terms of how he performed. A late-round running back target, Kyron Williams, has come up quite a few times in this show. And the other thing with Williams, we mentioned Puka and Williams, for both of those guys to go so late on the Rams offense and to both hit in such a way is also, I think, a little bit uh, unique and interesting. But they obviously went very late, but 
I think that it was a good year as we've hinted at a few times for for zero RB. And then there was a couple of the elite running backs that really hit. But I think what happened on the elite side is the gap from Brees Hall and Christian McCaffrey probably widened from the rest of the group there. And there's going to be quite a bit of flux in that market of, you know, we'll see what happens with Saquon and so on heading into this offseason. But what are you thinking for this season in terms of the, are we going to see people over learn from the lessons of the past couple of years? We kind of talked a little bit. And I think it's a good thing to talk about because, when you're talking the strategy that we try and talk here and like road of his overtime or road of his, it's like trying to learn through what is happening in the landscape. And also then like we talked about with your example of the Chris Godwin, Jamar Gibbs example in the first show, you know, making your own informed decision as to which of these players you want to do, but you also have to make those decisions while you're on the clock. So Sean's example of winning last year, taking those running backs when he's on the clock, which, you know, we, we talk about being comfortable in those maybe uncomfortable situations for yourself, whether that's, taking your sixth wide receiver in the sixth round or whether that's drafting your fourth uh, running back in the sixth round it can be in different situations but do you think when we are diving in there'll be so much content we're talking about all the different things that work things that didn't work do you think that there's a risk that drafters are going to kind of overlearn on the running back landscape from the last couple of seasons yeah, I, I think that as wide receiver is more heavily drafted, people will feel like they need to draft it. And I'm worried that owners will be more position specific rather than player specific. Sean wasn't just taking running backs because they were available. He was taking running backs because the players that he felt had the best chance of winning him the league were running backs. And anecdotally, I know from my friends that they know me as the zero running back guy. So they all want their drafts to draft wide receivers so they can show me their draft board and say, "How? what do you think of my draft? And what they don't recognize is at times, you know, if you're drafting Amari Cooper, I'm not going to like your draft, even if you're drafting a wide receiver. So, so much of this is about flexibility and player specific takes, and you need to be taking the best players on the board, regardless of position. So I do worry that drafters will make that mistake and not realize that you need to be taking the best players and not just a position. And the way I kind of have been thinking about that even last season, but really when we're starting to move into this year is like the running back dead zone. But I, I do think now we are clearly in the midst of there's going to be a wide receiver dead zone. And basically the easiest way to explain that for people who've been listening to the show for a long time is basically the profiles that people are drafting off a dead zone running back, but basically the equivalent of a wide receiver. And I think we're going to see and we already have seen wide receivers get pulled up higher and higher and more like we talked about in show one more wide receivers get drafted by each point of the draft but that's also going to mean that there's wide receivers being drafted there who just are not worth having on your roster as the season goes along so i think the the wide receiver dead zone is is here i think it's here to stay i think it's gonna be interesting to see it develop over the next you know year or so one of the things that mike you just referenced was that when i took my fifth running back and i liked the five guys that i had even though they did not all hit it was helpful when etn hit again in the playoffs after he had hit early and helped in a specific week to go ahead and, and win that championship there because he had a, a long stretch where listeners of the show know that we weren't that happy with the coaching for the jacksonville jaguars we won't go into that but Looking Were at we the not five Sean? guys, we weren't that happy. We weren't. Looking at the five guys, my board and the way that I'm looking at the running backs who were remaining after that, and really like the next 20 guys that went, were that these are going to be the guys who actually have the dead zone characteristics, the dead zone traits. These are the types of backs we've always avoided. And I'm going to still avoid those backs even in a running back heavy draft that I had. And one of the things that I'm thinking and looking at as I make those moves is that all of these drafters who are very wide receiver heavy and have rosters that in many cases are better than mine structurally, the issue that they're going to then have is that when they fill in their running backs, they're going to be filling in with running backs who have dead zone traits. And so they have the wide receivers, but they don't have really what you want as a zero RB drafter at the running back position. Because one of the things that drafters, I think, tend to forget when they think about zero RB 
is what you mentioned, which is we're being very intentional with the wide receivers, and then we're being very intentional with the types of running backs that we draft. And so you're getting these amazing values at running back by ADP, but not in terms of traits, not in terms of the characteristics we're looking for. That doesn't mean that even later there aren't going to be interesting running back picks. Obviously, guys like HN, as you mentioned, and then the players who ended up being league winners, those guys are available still after that. But I thought that that part of it was interesting. And even though I didn't like it, I was like, at least I get in before this cliff that at least exists on my board in my mind based on how I like to draft. It doesn't necessarily mean, again, obviously, that I'm going to be right. What do you And I also think that you mentioned an interesting point where you're talking about taking away options from other teams, which when I started playing fantasy, I played on NFFC and Larry Johnson and Ladanian Tomlinson were the first two picks and they were dominant. And what people used to say is don't let the first owner or the second owner get one of them and then get Antonio Gates on the way back. You need to make sure that they're not able to get that running back one advantage and that tight end one advantage. And just drafting the same position, you're just going to get a watered down version of what other people have. So I think thinking of it in terms of game theory and what can I take away and how can I make my team strong and give me edges where I can beat other teams is a very important part of it. So one of the things that we were able to do in 2023 that was interesting and successful and, and probably would have been more successful if you're not also competing with Raheem Mostert and Kyron Williams teams, but in the dead zone, there were a lot of backs with extreme upside and you know column and i were able to hit in the main event ben and i were able to hit in the main event those types of things were a lot of fun i don't think that 2024 is necessarily going to be like that and one of the things that we are seeing is that in early drafts so we have some early adp from ffpc from underdog from some other contests you're seeing again this wide receiver heavy start but you're also seeing the exciting backs go early which only makes sense and was one of the kind of odd things about 2023 is that those backs either didn't exist because of some of the injuries we'd had to young players over the previous two or three years or they existed but there were enough warts that people were being careful and you can understand those things so 2024 is going to be a different puzzle what do you think is going to happen in apex drafts your type of format you know if, if people aren't playing apex obviously they're playing home league so this uh, these recommendations have a ton of relevance for anyone who is playing in those formats so we talk about those all the time i mean what league do you most want to win i mean it's going to be with your work friends with your college buddies all those types of things you have a lot of great data from leagues that are so similar how do you expect drafters to attack early in 2024 so to your first point, I think each year drafters are becoming smarter. And I think with best ball, the rise in popularity in best ball drafts and people drafting in January, February for the next year, you're having the smartest players draft. And I think the more casual drafters maybe change the ADP at the end. So I think things get a little bit easier maybe in August, September, where right now, I think that the people who are drafting right now are they have similar expertise to maybe this discussion and they're aware of these elements. Um, I think that as quarterback and like tight end, because at tight end, there's no clear previously we had Kelsey every year and we had Gronk and we kind of had that involved. And now it's like, okay, is Sam Laporta the number one? Is Kelsey going to fall really far? So tight end is kind of getting pulled out of it because there's, there's a number of options. Uh, quarterback we've discussed. I remember the trend at this point last year was, can you kind of win without getting one of the dual threat, Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, dominant quarterbacks? And what we saw is, yes, you definitely can win avoiding those guys. So we're getting more to the meat and potatoes and people are becoming smarter about avoiding the running back landmines. I think that there's kind of like a big eight at wide receiver when I look at the ADP of Lamb, Tyreek, Jefferson, Chase, Amon Ra, Puka, Garrett Wilson, and AJ Brown. Um, I think after that is like DJ Moore and Debo. And I think it kind of falls off. Um, so I think getting those guys is important early on. Um, I think that 
it because there's there's kind of a fall off and you want to get in before that fall off takes place um i think that it's going to be a very interesting year for rookies and they may have a big impact because maybe some rookies are drafted, rookie running backs are drafted to teams where, oh, there's concern that this guy's not going to get that much work because they like this other back. And maybe you'll be able to get some sort of rookie running back discount there, like, like a Chan this year. Um, and I think rookies just become more and more of a crucial element as, I mean, we see what Gibbs, Puka, Tank Dell, Laporta, Stroud did. And this rookie class with, I mean, Brock Bowers is supposed to be a stud. And, and I think that it's becoming, you're going to need to be very aware of player specific takes and the opportunity that they're potentially going to have and where you can kind of get an edge on these breakout players, because there's just no question that the market's becoming smarter in, in identifying them. Uh, one thing that you mentioned there is the kind of top tier of wide receivers. And I think it will become interesting as the ADP continues to develop over the coming months. Those It, it might make those later around draft slots even more advantageous than they would have in the past because you can potentially get a second one of those guys which would make it you know even better the other thing in the tight end i find very interesting because i think it could go two ways it could become well we have tight ends and it's not a case that there's a need to get them as early the other part i think is and what i think should be the case is people should think that if you don't have one of those kind of top six guys that your team gets absolutely buried uh throughout the entire season you know some of these younger guys particularly like the likes of a laporta or a mcbride for example i think when they step up into this top tier i think that say the six teams that don't have one of those top guys are going to really struggle to compete at that position and i i think we could be we, we thought this a few times we could be entering a, a kind of a golden age here at the tight end position so i'm interested to see how tight end over the next again we're looking here bigger picture two to three years develop and over obviously tight end premium makes that a little bit different than just mm. standard ppr this is the part though i think that a lot of people people usually just want this people just want the targets who are the player targets they don't care about what else you have to say just tell me who to draft who, who should we draft in 2024 who are some of your uh favorite early player targets uh, and potential difference makers in, in 2024 and what people want to know is who is the 2024 puka nakua <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's start if you aren't already aware i generally fade older players who have shown a decrease in efficiency so i'll start out by saying you won't find me selecting camara eckler pollard unless i'm just in an extremely difficult situation that would probably take place in the apex experts league and i would be forced to eat my words but even then i doubt it um I think an early round draft pick that I'm really excited about is Jameer Gibbs. I just think he's a superstar and the stats back it up. And I think there's more room to grow. I, David Montgomery is a good player, but I mean, Gibbs before contact, after contact, forcing missed tackles, breaking tackles. Uh, he's a player that I could just see being like the next Alvin Kamara. Um, so I think he's very, very exciting. I think that Sam Laporta fits a similar bucket in that as a rookie, when nobody, he was on very few people's radar. Uh, Sean will give a ton of credit to you, <laughs> but I think the casual player may have not even known who Sam Laporta was. And he goes, I do think for, that's fair. I think it's fair because for, we, we, I, I am, and we, you can get in a bubble sometimes when we're talking about these and we're talking to listeners and other people in the fantasy community and you're like this player's great and all of a sudden you think that every single person in the world has that same th like when you're in that bubble mm -hmm. but you are right like there's i there's people last year who and that'll be people this year with the rookies again who just are oblivious to to what's going on and i think that's becoming the edge but for sam laporta i think that I mean, he had a better rookie year than Gronk and Gronk Gronk went for 546 yards and 10 touchdowns as a rookie. As a sophomore, he went for 90 receptions, over 1300 yards and 17 touchdowns. I'm not saying that Laporta is going to be better than Gronk as a sophomore, but what you I'm are. saying is that will exactly be the title of the show. <laughs> that will be the title. Okay, yeah, good. I'm we have right, a title. I'm taking a note here. This is the note. I'm taking the note. So, I think that being aware that tight ends can break out in year two, and we saw everything that we wanted to see from Laporta and more. And 
maybe he's it. I mean, if we're talking about 20 wide receivers being gone by the middle of round three and you have Laporta available, he may be a game breaker for you. Um, in the middle rounds, I think my favorite is Trey McBride. Uh, you guys, I know, will be happy to hear that, but he's just such an explosive young player that has room to grow on a team that needs people to pass to. Um, I also think the Tank Dell versus Nico Collins thing is interesting because I'm not sure it's so definitive that one is so much better than the other and Nico seems to be going significantly ahead of him. I mean, if you look at right before Tank Dell got hurt, weeks 9 through 12, he was averaging 10.8 targets, 6.3 receptions for 92.3 yards and 1.3 touchdowns per game. And he averaged 9.5 yards per target for the season. So I also think it's one of those situations where a lot of people get very excited, let's say, for Nico Collins when um, Tank Dell gets hurt. But there's also a benefit in having two wide receivers on the same team that can keep the defense honest and if the offense with Stroud is really good and Stroud's throwing for 40 touchdowns both of those wide receivers are going to eat so question uh, just before we move to a different player on those two players Tank Dell's ADP I think is purely injury based it's the end of season narrative I think uh, yep. the other question I'm going to ask you is which of those two guys just like if you had to pick them at the exact same ADP would you rather I would That's a very Dale interesting question. I would, I would pick Dell, so I'm definitely going to come at the discount. And the other part then is, what if the Texans draft a wide receiver in this draft? How does that affect things? There's a lot of stuff going on with yeah. the Texans. I think Dell at the minute is a huge value at his ADP. Because, Sean, we were talking, you know, previewing ahead to this year in drafts before that injury, and he felt like somebody was going to sneak into those, you know, top three rounds. And obviously the injury has derailed that. But I think the Texans situation there is very interesting. Yeah, I, I think that he is such a fun pick and it's hard to imagine him and Stroud being like less dynamic in year two once they have some experience and we all know the sophomore breakouts. The one thing with his profile is I believe he was 24 year old rookie, um, but I, I don't think you can excuse his production even though he was an older rookie. So he's definitely a player that I'm very, very interested in. Um, the last one that I will give later in the draft is I'm always excited about guys like Jaleel McLaughlin, who just pop and are so fun and look so good. I don't know if he'll get any work, but for me, it's hard to avoid a late round pick that just has so much electricity, tr electricity that you feel like if Javante gets injured, like this guy is, is going to score a lot of fantasy points. And he may, I mean, at some point, I think Javante is going to be better this season recovering from the injury. And I do think that he's a player that I may be drafting a fair amount. But if he starts the season so slow and begins to disappoint, we may see a situation where McLaughlin gets a little bit more involved. And I think he's a, a fun player. Now, Mike, we talked a little bit about this in the first show, but I, I want to go back to this element in Apex League specifically, where you do have trading. So again, we have the, the home league element here, which I think people really, really enjoy. How active is the trading in your leagues? Should participants have any concerns about it? How do you guys handle collusion? And I mean, what's the general vibe here? I expect the players love this element of the leagues that you guys have. Yeah, so we actually recently did, we sent out an off-season survey with questions that we try and gain more information for how we can improve things at Apex. So one of the questions was, would you be interested in no trading leagues? And just over 60% said no. So I do believe to many, it's a valuable element. Um, there's two main segments in Dynasty and Redraft. Dynasty, the trading is extremely popular and constant with future picks and all of that stuff that I'm sure you're aware of. In Redraft leagues, I think it kind of varies where some of the leagues will be more like the experts league where everybody kind of holds and doesn't want to sell low on their players. Some leagues more frequently trade. Um, so it really just varies, but I think people like having the option where they can at least try and work the market and see what's available. Um, in terms of handling any possible collusion, uh, we simply ask owners to contact us if there's any trade that they disagree with in terms of fairness. Our trade review process includes a jury within the league and a jury of other owners in similar Apex leagues. Both juries vote 
And if both juries believe that the trade should be overturned, it is overturned. If either jury votes that the trade is fair, the trade stands. And we also monitor owners during these reviews to check if there's any potential relationship between the two parties. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, I think that we would get even more trading in Apex if people in the experts league if people didn't have an insane number of leagues if you're in say five expert or five apex leagues i mean that would just be absolutely perfect you're going to get in there and make some trades that really launch your team into that again that buyer that playoff position i love that element i did want to ask when we were having the discussion earlier and talking about these guys who made such a big impact in 2023 and maybe didn't get drafted at all. What do you see in the first couple of weeks of the season in terms of the free agent bidding? I know that's something that I enjoy so much in leagues that do have bidding. You mentioned you have the $500 budget and it's very competitive in the experts league to get these guys, especially obviously running backs and wide receivers were uh, guys like Puka did they command almost the full value after week one? I'm sure that you know across the large number of leagues, there were a lot of differences. But how is free agency or how is the bidding in those first couple of weeks generally go? How does that go in your leagues? I think there's a, no a number of elements at play. Puka definitely went for like 90% of the budget or 80% of the budget. And I think that there's also this element where Early in the season, everyone is engaged and it takes one of 12 owners to say, okay, this guy could be a difference breaker for my team. I want him. I'm going to bid a high amount on him. Where if you're in, let's say week nine, maybe people are, number one, some people have used some blind bidding money, but owners can be less engaged and, oh, my team doesn't really have a chance this year. I'm not even going to bother putting in bids. So I think that early on, yes, in the early weeks when somebody... Uh, like Puka makes a big impact. People are pretty aggressive going for them, as you would imagine. Um, and I, I've heard your strategy bidding where you go for the small bid and kind of slide in, or you go for the big bid and really try and make a splash. And I think that some people are kind of keenly aware of that advice. We also have waivers that run um, for blind bidding followed by first come first serve waivers so some people will save their money and pick up players after uh, we actually surveyed owners to ask do you like having first come first serve waivers would you prefer just blind bidding and that was another i think like 85 percent liked the first come first serve waivers um i think that being able to okay on saturday this player's hurt i'm able to make some moves um i think that's an element that people like yeah, that's definitely my favorite, you know, waiver option of all the different options you can have. So definitely, I agree with the the survey I'll there. I spend on, on all my one. money sometimes, and so having first come first serve <laughs> yeah. that allows sometimes you to spend it. everything to still participate is pretty nice. Yeah, definitely. The last thing as we get ready to wrap up today again, once again, Mike, awesome having you on to talk through everything. I mentioned at the start the the website is apexfantasyleagues.com. But how can the listeners get involved in an Apex League if they want? And, and what, what have you maybe in store for people who want to participate in, in 2024? Yeah, we have redraft leagues. We have auction leagues. We have dynasty leagues for all fantasy players at various uh, price points. We would love to have you guys come join. We have dynasty orphans that need to be sold. We have new dynasty leagues filling. Um, we have a, f I mean, obviously Sean and Calm have you covered for content, but if you need any additional written articles to read, we have a free blog where you can read our insightful strategy-based articles. Um, we'd love to have you join in the community. So come to apexfantasyleagues.com and get in on the action. It's Mike, awesome. we, ha we do have people ask from time to time about auction leagues and where they can get involved with that. You know, sometimes it's a little bit more difficult. Some formats only have it in person. Obviously, if you can do an in-person auction league, then, you know, do that. You're not going to have more fun in fantasy. How do your auction leagues work if people are, you know, listening to this show and specifically thinking, you know, auction is what I want to do and I want to do more of, and this sounds like an opportunity. They're mainly live auctions. We have some email auctions where it's 
I believe, 12 hours per player is being auctioned and you can bid and the clock resets if there's a new high bidder. Um, we also have live auctions that are online. ESPN has the best software, so we actually have our auction drafts there and then they are transferred to my fantasy league. Um, people love them. Uh, the auction people are like a cult. They are very serious about their auctions. And we get a lot of emails like, I love your auction leagues. Why don't you add more auctions? And they're just, they're kind of niche. They're not hugely popular. People, some people just have no interest in auction leagues, but the people who play in them love them. There's definitely another element of strategy to it. And like I talked about at the start of the show on Monday, you know, we're always trying to broaden horizons with different strategies and different playing formats to again give yourself the ability to make those decisions when you're on the clock that we we've kind of talked about throughout these two shows so it's been absolutely awesome to have mike on sean before we close it out i don't know if you have any final words final questions i'll let you jump on before we we close it out here no it's been awesome to have mike on here i'm already looking forward to the 2024 experts league and yeah, I mean, the, the auction element is so much fun. Definitely, you know, we, we could be back kind of revisiting this in August, doing a, a Rotoviz overtime auction league with Apex. So that's something that we'll have to keep in mind. No promises to the listeners, but I know that anytime we do a show like this, we do get Sean, the listeners are interest. So the, the yeah, listeners well, are reaching out already for, for listener league. So the, the, the appetite is there, I think. I think so. I think so. So that is going to do it for this edition of Road of His OT. As I mentioned at the start, if you haven't checked out the Monday edition with Mike on as well, head back and check that out. A lot of content, I think, in both of these shows that will prove to be quite evergreen. So hopefully you're going to enjoy listening in to those. Thanks again, Mike, for jumping on. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having us, for having me, guys. It was it was just an absolute blast. That's awesome. So we will wrap it up there. My name is Colin Kelly. You can follow me on Twitter at Over to Martin. My co-host is Sean Siegel. You can check out his work up at rotaviz.com. If you are signing up over at Rotoviz, you can use the code RV Radio 2024 at checkout to get yourself a 10% discount off a Rotoviz NFL pass. And until we are back, have a good one. <laughs>